Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Cliff Kirsch, and I'd like to welcome you to the Evershed Sutherland Webcast Advisors Act Regulatory Ser Series Second Quarter Update. I'm joined today by Michael Koffler, Issa Hanna, Ben Marzouk, Bri Adams, and Sue Lee. This uh, program is our second in 2018 of our quarterly series of complimentary webcasts dedicated to issues impacting uh, advisors. Uh, just before we begin a, uh, a housekeeping note, if, if you would like to receive CLE credit for this webcast, please download the CLE sign-in sheet and evaluation form from your viewing console and follow the instructions for submission. If you have any questions during the webcast, please submit them via the Ask a Question text box on your viewing uh, console. And if you'd like to request a copy of the slide deck, please feel free to contact any one of us. Uh, a lot's happened since our first uh, quarter update. Here's what we're going to be covering uh, in this next hour. We're going to start with the SEC's proposed fiduciary duty interpretation. Then we're going to look at OC's risk alert on advisory fees and expenses, uh, and then turn to uh, the SEC's 12B1 share class initiative and some uh, related enforcement developments. Then look at FinCEN's customers' uh, due diligence FAQs, uh, and then uh, FINRA's OBA private securities rule proposal with a uh, particular view as to how it uh, impacts the advisory industry and then developments regarding uh, performance advertising. So again, a lot to cover in the uh, hour and for the, uh, to tee up the discussion on the SEC's proposed fiduciary duty interpretation, I'm going to turn it over to Issa Hanna. Thanks very much, Cliff, and uh, thank you to everybody for participating in today's webcast. Uh, we've got a lot to cover here today. so. I'm uh, going to try to get through this as quickly as possible. Uh, so it's, it's worth kind of just uh, stepping back for a moment and, and asking what just happened with respect to the SEC's uh, package of, uh, of rules and, and um, interpretations um, that just came out. Well, on April 18th, um, the SEC um, voted 4-1 to one to release um, three different proposals. Um, one would establish, an, uh, establish a new standard of care uh, for broker dealers, we're not going to get we're not going to delve into that today, but it's worth mentioning. Uh, the second uh, would um, require broker both broker dealers and investment advisors to deliver deliver something called a relationship summary or a form CRS. Um, now that is going to apply to both broker dealers and investment advisors as well as dual registrants. Um, the third piece of the proposal um, is an interpretation, a proposed in interpretation. Um, regarding the standard of care that's applicable to investment advisors, the fiduciary duty. Um, we're going to get into that into some detail. Um, and, um, you know, there's a 90-day comment period with respect to all three pieces of the proposal. Um, and the comment period closes on August 7th, 2018. So moving on to the next slide here, um, just getting into the, um, the the third piece of the of the proposal, which was the uh, proposed fiduciary duty interpretation. Um, one thing that the SEC tries to make clear in, in that proposed interpretation is that their, their intent is not to change um, the nature of the fiduciary duty. Um, rather, the, 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 interpretive, the imper interpretive release is intended to provide um, clarity or a restatement of existing guidance under the fiduciary duty that exists under Section 206 of the Advisors Act. So, um, it's not the, the intent here is that there, there shouldn't be anything new, that there shouldn't be a big surprise. Um, with that said, um, you know there there are um, some interesting aspects of um, the proposal or certain phrasings of the um, of the nature of the fiduciary duty that um, do warrant some interest. Um, and again, the, the SEC is asking for comment on um, this proposal, so. To the extent that there, there are certain there are certain language within the proposal that's um, interesting to somebody, or um, or if uh, anybody might think that it requires further explanation from the SEC, there is an opportunity to request um, further guidance or to suggest um, an interpret a further interpretation. Um, the one thing to note about the proposal is that it's not an exhaustive discussion of the fiduciary duty that applies to investment advisors. Um, the SEC's intent was more to hit the major points um, with, with respect to um, the, the fiduciary duty that applies to investment advisors. It's, a, it's actually a pretty brief release. Um, in, 
the release total is about 30 pages, and only about two-thirds of it um, covers the fiduciary duty that, that, that applies to, to investment advisors. So by no means is it an exhaustive tome on um, the, the, the fiduciary duty that, that applies to investment advisors. The, the release is divided into two main parts um, with a, a few subparts. They first discuss the duty of care that's applicable to investment advisors that exists under the investment advisor fiduciary duty, and then that's subdivided into a, um, three different discussions. First, the obligation to provide advice that's in the, uh, the customer's uh, best interest. Second, the obligation to um, seek best execution for um, your investment advisor clients. And then third, your obligation to um, continually monitor your, uh, re your, your investment advisory client's accounts. Um, and then the second piece of it is a discussion of the duty of loyalty. Um, and, you know, Issa, one, one point uh, just, to, just to add quickly is regulation best interest on the broker-dealer side, like you said, focuses on the retail investor. Correct. This interpretive guidance would be for for all clients, right? It's not limited to... Correct. I mean, there's, there is not an exhaustive discussion or really much discussion of um, how the interpretive guidance would specifically apply in the private fund or the institutional right. space, but there's nothing in the release that says this is only a discussion of how the fiduciary duty applies in the retail investment advisor space. It's intended to have equal force in institutional or high net worth or, um, or you know, private fund type um, considerations. It's not, it's not just a retail fiduciary duty discussion. But there are a lot of um, helpful, there's a lot of helpful gloss in the release about how to apply or how, how the fiduciary duty is applied or interpreted in the retail investment advisor context. Uh, and, you know, kind of getting into you know, the, the nature of, of the discussion there and some, some interpret, interpretive points that have come up. If you, if, you, uh, if you look at specifically page 17 of the release, um, specifically discussing the application of the duty of loyalty, there, there have been some, um, some interpretive questions that have come up. You know, in that, in that duty of loyalty discussion, you know, the SEC does say that in certain circumstances, disclosure alone may not be sufficient to effectively um, uh, mitigate a conflict uh, or to, to get um, a, you know, a client's consent to conflict, but the SEC doesn't really provide any examples of when such a situation might arise, when, when you have a situation where disclosure is not enough. And it's another interpretive issue um, that has come up with respect to this release is that you can't um, infer client consent to a conflict where it's not possible for the client to understand or the, the facts regarding the conflict can't be fully and fairly disclosed. Uh, the SEC doesn't provide any examples of such a conflict. They just say that, there are, that, that these conflicts exist. And then third, you know, related to that second point, the SEC says when you have one of these conflicts that just not, it's not possible to, to fully and fairly disclose it. Um, you have to either eliminate it or adequately mitigate it. But the SEC doesn't really provide any examples of what constitutes adequate mitigation. So those are some interpretive issues that have come up with respect to the interpretation. Um, if, you know, if, if anybody might be interested in, in commenting, I, I think that those are fertile grounds for comment and fertile grounds for a back and forth with the SEC regarding you know, this aspect of the proposal. Moving on to the next slide, uh, within the, the proposal, uh, the, the investment advisor interpretation proposal, there's also a, uh, a, a proposal to propose uh, perhaps three different uh, types of rules uh, that might apply to investment advisors. There, there, there's no actual proposal here. There, what the SEC is asking the industry to comment on is whether it's a, it might be a good idea to issue proposals in these areas. So the first has to do with the licensing and continue, continuing education requirements for investment advisors um, and, and their personnel. Um, second has to do with account statements 
and the third has to do with financial responsibility. Generally, what, what the SEC is, is trying to do here um, is to fulfill, a, you know, perhaps a prerogative that arose under Section 913 of the Dodd-Frank Act, which asked the SEC to study ways in which the harm, ways in which the um, regulation of investment advisors and broker dealers could be harmonized. And what the SEC has identified here is these three areas, which it believes could uh, be enhanced in the investment advisor area to achieve investor protection that's uh, to a level that currently that currently exists on the broker dealer uh, side of the federal securities laws. So what they're saying here is broker dealers have you know, federal licensing and continuing education requirements for their personnel, investment advisors don't. Broker-dealers have an account statement requirement under Rule 10b-10. Unless an investment advisor has custody, it really doesn't have an obligation to ensure that account statements are delivered. Uh, and then the third, third thing is that um, you have financial responsibility requirements that, are, that apply on the broker-dealer side of the federal securities laws, and those things might include net capital requirements, uh, customer protection rules, bonding, et cetera, that do not currently exist under the investment advisor side of the, of the regulatory sphere. So these are, these are ideas that the SEC is putting forth. They might, um, they might pursue these, they might not, but the SEC is asking for comment from the industry as to whether it might be a good idea to pursue um, these, these lines of, uh, of rulemaking. Sure, and I just uh, just to add to that a little um, on the licensing and continuing education, um, the SEC talks about the fact that this is required under thinner rules, and they asks, you know, is there a you know there is a difference in, in regulation here? Is, is that something we should we should uh, you know is, is there a protection issue, investor protection issue that would really force us to to have something at the federal level um, in addition to the state level? And on the financial responsibility requirements, what was driving that was the SEC's observation that when it finds fraud. Uh, committed by uh, advisors because there's no capital requirement. Many advisors don't have the assets to make the clients whole when there's fraud, and that's that's the idea behind throwing this out as an um, as something that it's thinking about. Um, it's really to make sure there are assets to make clients whole if there in if there are cases of fraud. So we had a question come in, which uh, is an interesting question about um, can we comment on whether regulation best interest requirement that broker dealers. Um, uh, mitigate or eliminate financial conflicts of interest impacts an IA's responsibilities under the release that ESA was talking about. And I, I'd say not directly. Um, regulation best interest only applies to broker-dealers. Uh, the interpretive release under the Advisors Act applies to advisors. It is worth noting that there's a discussion in uh, the release for regulation best interest that with respect to dual registrants, um, regulation, would not, regulation best interest would not apply to a dual registrant if the advice is formulated in the dual registrant's capacity as an investment advisor, even if the trade is executed through the broker-dealer, that same entity. So, uh, and there's a discussion to release about how do you determine which side of the house uh, the advice was formulated on. And there are, it's actually a very interesting discussion, and there are uh, various factors uh, that are listed by the commission in the release that I would really direct dual registrants on the phone to really take a hard look at because it may impact um, how you want to position the advice you provide going forward. Um, now, I say not directly, uh, and that's clearly the black letter law answer, uh, but uh, the reason I said not directly is, you know, the, the release on, uh, for regulation best interest has a lot, there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of stuff in there about um, things broker dealers should, should consider from a policies and procedures and an operational and process perspective. And it, it would seem hard to conclude that advisors are not going to be held to at least the same thing. Because if they're subject to a fiduciary standard, how could the advisors not have to do at least what broker dealers are going to be required to do under regulation best interest? So while the answer is not, you know, the answer is no, uh, black letter law, I think it's going to have an impact that, um, in terms of this how practice develops. Yeah, and, and, and to add to that, Michael, I think that's consistent with recent commentary from you know, members of the SEC staff and from SEC commissioners regarding you know, the, the nature of, the, of, the, of Reg BI and the, the standard of care that arises under Reg BI. They don't really see um, much daylight. I think that was the, the words that, um, that, that Chair, Chair Clayton actually used the other day in a speech at the FINRA conference. 
they don't see any daylight between the broker-dealer standard of care and the investment advisor standard of care as it, as it applies to a, a recommendation. So, you know, take from that what you will. Okay. Um, moving on uh, to the next slide here, I know we, we spent a lot of time on the interpretive release um, for investment advisors. It's important to also note that there, there is a, a second part of this rulemaking package that applies to investment advisors, and it would, it would essentially constitute what the SEC is, is um, proposing to call a Form ADB-3, uh, and it's also called a, a Form CRS or a Relationship Summary. It, it follows um, a similar type of, of um, you know, process as Form ADB in terms of setting forth a certain list of items that a registrant has to uh, respond to and, um, and also setting forth some instructions with respect to the types of content that must be included in the form. It, it covers eight distinct areas, an introduction, um, a description of, of the relationship between the, the registrant and the, the client and the nature of the services that are being provided, the standard of conduct that the registrant is to be held to, a summary of fees and costs. You have to provide a comparison between yourself and other registrants. You have to disclose certain conflicts of interest. Um, you have to provide certain additional information about where, um, you, where information can be found about your disciplinary history, and then you're supposed to provide a list of key questions that are really meant to be uh, kind of like an icebreaker with your client that they can ask so that they can ask certain questions about the nature of your product, your products or services. One quick note about this before we move on to the next slide is that you're not required to provide this CRS uh, relationship summary if your only clients are institutional type clients. The, the, the scope of this is with respect to any, re, any of your retail investors. You're, pro, you're required to provide this to retail investors. So if you, if you only deal in the institutional space, this new requirement is not going to apply to you. Uh, just quickly going through these slides, the, the relationship summary um, is, is a highly standardized form. You have to actually use certain specified phrasing and formatting. Yeah, and actually, in certain parts of the form, you're actually required to use tables, and you can't do anything but the table type of disclosure. You have to um, include, uh, yeah, you can't include disclosure outside of the four corners of the instructions. So if you want to customize it in a certain way or to provide certain additional information, that's actually not permitted pursuant to the, the instructions. You have to file the, you have to follow the formulation that's set forth in the instructions. You have to respond to every single item and provide responses in the same order that, that's set forth in the, in the instructions. You're actually held to a four-page page limit. And in addition to that, if, if, you, if you're trying to squeeze the, the information into four pages, you're having difficulty. If you're trying to play around with the margins or the font, there's a certain limit as to how, how small the font can get and the mar the, how far the margin, margin can go. They're that specific about complying with the limit. The, there are different requirements in the form depending on what type of entity you are or what type of registra registrant you are, whether you're a standalone broker-dealer, a standalone investment advisor, or a dual registrant. It really follows a flowchart type of approach. So the instructions say, if you're a standalone investment advisor, say X. If you're a standalone broker-dealer, say Y. If you're a dual registrant, say Z. Um, the SEC provides uh, certain mock-ups of what a form CRS should look like, but they're not intended to be a safe harbor. Moving on to the, to the next slide here, the, the SEC very much wants to, um, you know, provide a, a layered approach to disclosure. And the, the idea here was the, the SEC thought that maybe uh, there, there was some confusion in the industry or a confusion amongst uh, retail customers and clients as to what type of relationship, um, you know, investment advisors and broker-dealers might be providing to, to, to uh, customers and clients. The idea behind the form is to explain or to provide an explanation to, to customers and clients the difference between an investment advisor relationship and a broker-dealer relationship. And the idea here is to provide a layered approach so that people aren't overwhelmed. Give, them a, give, give retail customers and clients a short disclosure that lays out the nature of the relationship, the nature of the, the services, and supposedly a short approach, and then refer them to a more fulsome disclosure, um, a second layer of disclosure that gets into specific conflicts and specific um, nature of the services and products that are being offered. So it's, it's very much intended to be a high-level document that covers the nature of the relationship. 
um, if if you um, deliver the 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 uh, CRS in, in a paper format, you're actually required to provide it as a first document or at the top of any stack of documents that you provide to a customer so that they're reading that first, so that they're engaging with that document first to kind of understand what the nature is of the, of the relationship they might be entering. Uh, the, the layered approach to disclosure supposedly borrows from the mutual fund summary prospectus regime. And um, if, uh, you know, if, if you uh, have an electronic version of, of the form, um, you actually have to include hyperlinks to, to cross-reference disclosure in, in keeping with the layered approach. So if you say that you, know, you have more information available on a particular conflict or a particular service in a different area, you actually have to include a cross-reference, and if it's an electronic version, you have to include a link that directs the, the customer or the client to the additional disclosure. So that's kind of in keeping with the layered approach. Uh, the, with respect to the delivery requirements, again, you're only required to deliver this to retail investors, and it's important to note that you're not required. To, that it's important to note the distinction between the two terms here that appear in the package of, of the proposals. You're required to deliver it to retail investors, not retail customers. Retail customers is, a, is a, the scope or the, the definitional scope that applies in the context of Reg BI. Retail investors is arguably a, a broader term. It, it's really just any individual. So. Yeah, and just uh, we had a quick question on that. Yep. Um, if you're an advisor to a mutual fund or a sub-advisor to a mutual fund, um, if that's the extent of your advisory uh, activities, the form is not going to apply to you because the uh, investors in the fund are not your advisory clients or shareholders of the fund. Yep. So um, just want to make clear if, if your business is limited to acting as an advisor or sub-advisor for funds, uh, you're not going to have a form CRS uh, obligation. Just, just like you don't have an ADV obligation. With respect to the uh, shareholders of the fund, correct? Correct, yep. yep. Uh, thanks, Michael. And thanks for that, that, um, that, that clarification. The, the, with respect to the delivery requirements, you, know, you are required to deliver it to just retail investors. There, what the SEC, this is interesting, the SEC is, is proposing something called a transition period where, where they, would, they would require you to deliver the, the form CRS to both any, any new customers or clients that you get in that, during that transition period, but also make, make a delivery to any of your existing customers and clients, anybody that's already um, a customer or client of yours. This would be the case even if you haven't spoken to that person in years or months. Um, if they're happy with the relationship, if they understand it perfectly fine, you're still required to disclose to, to make this disclosure to everybody you already have on the books as an existing customer or client. So that's an interesting aspect of the proposal. Uh, you're required to make a delivery uh, upon any material to change to the form, uh, and it's a, it's a prompt um, update or prompt delivery requirement. You're required to make, make that delivery within 30 days, according to the proposal. Um, there are certain uh, delivery obligations to, to new customers and clients. If you have a new customer or client, the, the, the obligation is, is when uh, the, the delivery obligation kicks in basically um, at the time of uh, the formation of the relationship or any time before that. And then um, with respect to existing customers or clients, it's basically whenever there's a, there's a change to the nature of the relationship, whether they're opening up a new account or they're changing to a different type of account. Moving on to you know, the next, next uh, slide here, there's, there's certain filing requirements as well. Just to quickly go through this, if you're an investment advisor, you're going to be required to file this on the IARD. If you're a broker-dealer, you're going to be required to, register, to, to file it on EDGAR. And if you're a dual registrant, you're going to be required to file it on both. Uh, there's going to be an obligation to update those filings. Um, if you have a material change, you have to update it within 30 days on both IARD and EDGAR as appropriate and then you also have to file it or post it on your firm website. Uh, moving through these, these last couple of slides here, I'll, I'll just try to be really brief. I thought it was interesting to kind of compare the, some of the required language in the form CRS. One thing that really stood out to me was uh, that on the broker-dealer side of the instructions, you're, you're required to tell um, customers about, about conflicts, but not necessarily perhaps in a way that they might understand. But on the investment advisor side, you're required to say that we're required to tell you about conflicts of interest in a way that you can understand. I thought that was an interesting difference, perhaps unintended, between the two, two types of instructions. 
And then moving on to the last slide here with respect to CRS, in the digging into item six of the instructions, the conflicts of interest section, what, what I found interesting about, about these instructions is that they apply uniformly. It doesn't matter whether you're a standalone investment advisor or a standalone broker dealer or a dual registrant. You have to follow this approach with, the, with respect to conflicts of interest, which may be kind of unworkable for a lot of, a lot of entities because you're only required to discuss these three conflicts uh, relating to proprietary products, third-party payments, and principal transactions, and nothing else. And, um, you know, for, for certain entities, that they're not may, maybe not going to be applicable. Um, and it's interesting that the SEC took a, a uniform approach with respect to all different registrants. So that's perhaps something that's uh, fertile ground for comment in response to the CRS proposal. Well, yeah, I, I, th I think there'll be a lot of comment with the CRS because, you know, wh where the SEC is, is doing uh, consumer testing. They're, they're going to go out and speak to investors, and as they do that, a lot, uh, a lot could change. We're going to shift gears now and pivot to uh, the discussion of OC's uh, risk alert on advisory fees and expenses, I'm, and, and I'm going to turn it over to Bria Adams for that. But before I do, uh, just again, housekeeping. For those of you who would like to receive CLE credit for today's webcast, our confirmation code is FIDUCIARY. So please use uh, this code, FIDUCIARY, for the sign-in sheet available for download from your viewing uh, console. So again, I'm going to turn it over to Bria. Now we're going to sort of plow through some of the uh, other developments uh, in this quarter. Thank you, Cliff. So last month, the SEC's Office of Compliance Inspections and Examinations, or OC, issued a risk alert on advisory fees and expenses. The risk alert reflects issues identified in deficiency letters from over 1,500 advisor examinations over the past two years. As an example of actions taken in this area, OC noted two recent actions against advisors related to advisory fees and expenses in 2017. They also noted six areas in which OC um, noticed frequent compliance deficiencies with respect to advisory fees and expenses. The first being fee billing based on incorrect account valuations. Second, billing fees in advance or with improper frequency. Third, applying incorrect fee rates. Fourth, advisor expense misallocations. Fifth, omitting rebates and applying discounts incorrectly. And sixth, disclosure issues involving advisory fees. So on the next slide, we're taking a look at the first area that they noticed um, deficiencies in. So the first observation included fee billing based on incorrect account valuations. These were things such as the valuation of clients accounts using a different metric from that which is outlined in the client's advisory agreement. An example would be the valuation of illiquid assets using original cost as opposed to the fair market value. The second observation that OC noted is the valuation of clients' accounts using a process that differs from the process outlined in the advisory agreement. As an example of this, OC noted that advisors were assessing the market value of the client's account at the end of the billing cycle as opposed to using the average daily balance of the account assets. Or advisors were failing to exclude certain assets for purposes of the fee calculation. So this might include failing to exclude cash or cash equivalents, alternative investments, or variable annuities. On the next slide, we talk about the second area that OC noticed um, deficiencies in. OC noticed that billing fees in advance or with improper frequency was an issue with some advisors as well. OC noted that the frequency of fees were inconsistent with what was stated in advisory agreements or in Form ADV. They also noted that advisors were billing in advance despite advisory agreements stating that the client would be billed in arrears. OC noted that advisors failed to prorate fees for clients whose advisory services began mid-billing cycle. And finally, OC noted that advisors failed to reimburse clients whose advisory services ended mid-billing cycle as outlined in their form ADVs. So on the next slide, we talk about the third area. The third area that OC identified during examinations is the application of incorrect fee rates. OC noted that advisors charged a higher fee rate than agreed upon in advisory agreements or even doubled client, uh, double billed clients. And OC also noted that advisors charged non-qualified 
clients performance fees based on percentage of capital gains, which is inconsistent with Section 205 of the Advisors Act. The fourth area that OC identified um, is the misallocation of expenses. Here, OC noted that advisors were allocating distribution and marketing expenses, regulatory filing fees, and travel expenses to clients instead of to the advisor, which was in contravention of advisory agreements or operating agreements or other disclosures that the advisor made. On the next slide, the fifth area that OC observed is advisors that omitted rebates or applied discounts incorrectly. Examples in this area include advisors who failed to aggregate client account values for households as described in their advisory agreements or form ADVs, advisors who failed to reduce a client's fee rate when the client's account value reached a certain level as described in the advisory agreement or form ADV as well, or charging clients brokerage fees for transactions that qualified under a wrap fee program. So the next slide is the sixth and final area that we noticed, or that OC noticed frequent compliance deficiencies, which involved uh, disclosure issues with advisory fees. OC noted that advisors were engaging in business practices that were inconsistent with disclosures in their form ADVs. For example, client advisory fees exceeded maximum fees stated in the Form ADV. OC also noticed that advisors were failing to disclose additional fees or markups in addition to advisory services. For example, collecting fees in, access, in excess of actual fees. And last, OC noted that advisors were earning additional compensation or participating in fee sharing arrangements uh, without disclosing these things to their clients. I think the takeaway here that the SEC noted is that advisors should look at their practices with respect to fees and expenses and look at their disclosures and consider whether proactive steps are necessary to, um, to make these two uh, aligned. And the SEC speaks more to this in its conclusion. Next, we'll hear from ESA with exam and enforcement trends. Yeah, and, and thanks for your uh, just just a quick word. Th thanks for knowing that. I mean, what what the SEC is really doing, and there's there's a uh, an, an ex expectation that advisors will have looked at this, and as you say, sort of formally tracked to you know their practices and disclosure along these uh, these points that you raised. So thanks. And yeah, we're, we're going to turn now to uh, the share class uh, initiative. That's been a regulatory focus for the for the last uh, several years now, but is really. Uh, a very targeted uh, activity by the SEC. Great. Thanks, Cliff, and thanks, Bria. So moving on to here to um, examine enforcement trends, as, as Cliff mentioned, uh, share class issues have been a huge area of focus for the SEC on the retail side for some time. Just as a brief kind of background or refresher here, earlier this year the SEC made available or informed the industry that they were going to be making um, – beneficial or favorable settlement terms uh, to, to um, investment advisors should they decide to come forward uh, to the SEC and tell them about their share class issues. Um, so the SEC here laid out a number of different conditions as to whether you can participate in the initiative. Those who decide to participate in the initiative, again, get supposedly favorable um, settlement terms. If you decide not to participate in the initiative and you do have share class issues, the SEC said, that you know, there's there's no guarantee that you know that we'll, we'll treat you so nicely. Moving on to the to the next slide here, the the, the really the, the biggest development since our last webinar, because we did discuss it discuss the the initiative briefly during our last webinar, is that the um, the SEC came out with some FAQs for those uh, those firms who are evaluating whether they want to participate in the initiative. The you know the, the FAQs hit on a number of topics. Um, just kind of to briefly go through a few of them that I thought were most interesting. The FAQ number two makes clear that the initiative only applies with respect to 12B1 fees. So if you had some kind of conflict with respect, with respect to sub-TA fees or revenue sharing, those aren't going to be part of your, your settlement terms. You're not going to be able to settle on these favorable terms with respect to those, those issues. So you're still subject to you know, liability or um, in, you know, enforcement with respect to those issues. Uh, FAQ number four here 
something, something that was interesting is that the SEC basically said that no matter how big your share class issue is, no matter how many 12B1 fees you've been properly collected or assessed, you're 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 still eligible, and everybody's eligible for the for the same federal, you know same settlement terms. Doesn't matter how big your issue or how small it is. Um, and then the the final thing here is uh, FAQs number nine and eleven. They provide some guidance for firms who are evaluating their their exposure and whether to self-report. Um, you know, one important aspect of of the initiative is that as a threshold matter, you have to figure out whether your whether whether a, a, re, an, a, a a lower cost share class was reasonably available um, to um, to investors, and they provide some guidance about what it means for uh, an, a lower cost share class to be reasonably available. And then the other thing was um, you know, disclosure. In, in certain cases, you might be able to argue with the SEC, "Hey, my disclosure was good enough. I adequately disclosed the conflict." And you know, the, the SEC basically here provides. Some, um, some guidance as to what would constitute adequate disclosure for these purposes. And I'll just say it's a pretty high bar. Yeah. It's, it's not just disclosure of the receipt of 12B1 fees or that, it create, or, or that the receipt creates a conflict of interest. Um, it, you have to go a step further and disclose that you're essentially recommending uh, share classes that have um, 12B1 fees and a, that are more expensive, even though a, 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 a less expensive share class is available. And if you yep. don't have that disclosure, you're not going to satisfy the disclosure standard. Yep. Uh, last slide here in the exam enforcement trends section. The, the SEC brought a few cases in April um, that kind of illustrate the share class disclosure initiative or, or illustrate, um, I guess, maybe what, maybe what the message what the SEC was trying to send here was, Hey, if you if you don't co you know come into the, the initiative and, and self-report here, this is what you can expect. Um, we're still taking this seriously. We're going to um, continue doing enforcement actions against those firms who um, you know who have 12B1 issues or share class issues. Uh, the three actions were against Janeos Wealth Management, Securities America, and PNC Investments. A um, couple of interesting points here: uh, the the SEC based um, their their enforcement action on on two claims. First, that there, there wasn't adequate disclosure, and something to note with respect to the, the disclosure um, language in, in all three of these enforcement actions is that it, it mirrors the, 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 um, the FAQ that I was referring to earlier. The, the formulation is pretty similar in terms of what would have constituted adequate disclosure. So the SEC is being consistent here. Uh, second thing, not so consistent with the initiative, is that in all three actions, the SEC alleged a, a breach of a duty to seek best, best execution. It's, it's interesting because in, if you look at the, the announcement that was issued in, in February of this year, this year when, they, when the SEC announced the, uh, the share class selection disclosure initiative, in footnote three of that release, they say, we're in the, uh, according to our settlement terms, we're not going to include a, a charge that you um, didn't meet your best execution obligations. But it's clear with respect to these actions that the SEC is still alleging in some cases, I guess, at least, a failure to seek best execution. And with that, I will turn it over to Ben to discuss the FinCEN customer due diligence rules. Okay, yeah, thanks, Issa. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm going to be discussing the FinCEN's customer due diligence rules, in particular some of the FAQs and recent developments in that area. But as, as just background, um, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, otherwise known as FinCEN, is the enforcement branch of Treasury, and they're tasked with administering and enforcing AML um, rules. Um, so uh, pursuant to a, a mandate under the Bank Secrecy Act, FinCEN proposed customer due diligence rules for legal entity customers back in uh, August of 2014. And after an extensive comment period, the rules were finally adopted in May 2016. Um, there was a two-year implementation period for the rules, uh, mainly to allow for a compliance build-out, uh, since this would be a, a major build for firms uh, that uh, haven't been previously capturing this information. Um, keep in mind that FinCEN already has customer due diligence rules for natural person customers. Those rules are just CIP, or, or Customer Identification Program, um, and FinCEN's had that in place for many years. Um, and those rules require the same covered financial institutions to identify and verify the identity of each individual natural person customer. Um, so up until now, those those CIP rules uh, have, typically, uh, have, have typically not applied to legal entities, and FinCEN viewed this as a pretty major uh, blind spot in uh, their AML compliance program, so they decided to propose rules 
extending it to legal entity customers. Um, so that's kind of just some background at a very high level. And as you see here on the slide, the general rule is that all covered financial institutions are required to take reasonable steps to identify and verify the beneficial owners of uh, legal entity customers. And so there's a number of important definitions, um, not just beneficial owners and legal entity customers, but also uh, covered financial institutions, because that's really who the rules apply to. Um, and a covered financial institution includes banks, broker dealers, mutual funds, futures commission merchants, and introducing commodity brokers. Uh, so this is the rule, who the rule directly applies to, those entities, and note that investment advisors are not included in the definition of a covered uh, financial institution. Um, those are the ones responsible for capturing this information, for sending the forms out. Um, people on the other receiving end will be the ones uh, you know, sending it back to the financial institution. So moving on, um, uh, you know, now that we've established who the rules apply to, uh, we can move to some of the other uh, important definitions. Um, so for beneficial ownership, um, there's two prongs, both an ownership and control prong. Um, for the ownership prong, you capture each natural person, individual who directly or indirectly owns 25% or more of a legal entity customer. So this uh, could be no more than four people and could potentially be no one if no individual owns 25% uh, more of that legal entity. Um, for the control prong, you capture a single natural person individual with significant responsibility to manage, control, or direct the legal entity. Um, keep in mind that each prong is independent, so you must capture both, uh, both the ownership and control person. So it could be anywhere from at most five people in which case that'd be four owners you identify, four 25% owners, um, and one uh, control person. Um, or as few as one person, where in, in which case you'd have no 25% owners um, and one person that you need to identify as a control person. Um, for the legal entity customer, FinCEN defines the term to mean any corporation, LLC, or, or other entity formed in the U.S. or abroad that opens an account. Uh, and, and that account definition is key. Um, but the key thing to consider uh, with the legal entity customer definition is that it specifically excludes investment companies, banks, broker dealers, and even investment advisors. So and I, as an IA, uh, you will not be asked directly by a covered uh, financial institution like a bank or broker dealer to disclose your natural person beneficial owners. And this makes sense because uh, IAs are already subject to disclosures about their ownership information on Form ADV. Um, so just a few, moving on, just a few final points um, I'd add here related to the definition of an account and the application to IAs um, before getting into the FAQs. Uh, first, remember, you only capture this information for legal entity customers that open an account. Uh, and the definition of account tra tracks the account definition, the IP rules I mentioned earlier. Um, and, and that definition changes based on the entity you're dealing with. So for a broker-dealer, it's a formal brokerage account relationship. For a bank, it'd be a formal uh, banking account established to hold deposits. Um, and this definition of an account does have exclusions. So there are exclusions for risk of retirement accounts and also for any account acquired through mergers or acquisitions. The idea being that ERISA is fairly low money laundering risk um, and for accounts opened by acquisition, they've already been through the CIP process at the original firm that they came over from. Um, and then secondly, uh, just allow me to touch on the impact to investment advisors. As I mentioned earlier, IAs are not included in the definition of a covered uh, financial institution and are not also included in the definition of a legal entity customer. Um, however, keep in mind that if you are an advisor to a legal entity customer, you may be receiving requests for the customer's beneficial ownership information. Um, here's FinCEN included an exception for certain pooled investment vehicles like hedge funds and private funds that are managed by SEC registered IAs. Uh, for pooled vehicles managed by state-registered IAs, you, the rules would apply, but you'd only need to capture the control prong. And one of the FAQs touches on that in just a second. Um, and then finally, just note that FinCEN um, did include in their proposed and release a statement that they may extend the rules eventually in the future to investment advisors. Um, so that's something to um, keep our eyes on moving forward. Um, moving on to the, uh, the FAQs that were recently released um, as of April 3rd uh, this year, um, just about a month before the rules went into effect. It's a fairly substantive list, list of FAQs. There were 37 questions in total, so I'm going to go ahead and highlight a few of the major ones here that I think might be applicable to the participants on the webinar. Um, but to the extent that you have questions, um, uh, reach out, because there's a lot of uh, specifics here in the questions that we don't have time to cover all of them, obviously. So um, if I don't cover something either on the receiving or sending end of how these rules may apply, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, so one of the, the old, really the only one that touched on investment advisors directly was uh, uh, FAQ number 18, um, and it had touched on 
the pooled investment vehicles I mentioned earlier. So what they said here was that um, uh, there's no look-through requirement for the ownership prong, um, which, is, which is based on practical considerations, um, because uh, as they said in the FAQ, it would be impractical for a firm to collect and verify information um, for the pooled investment vehicle because the ownership fl fluctuates so frequently. Um, so what they said is that for any pooled investment vehicle, you only need to collect information on the control person, just that one individual, the control prong. No need to look through for the um, uh, beneficial owner ownership prong. Um, FAQ number number 19 um, relates to trust, uh, and in particular trust with uh, multiple trustees. So the basic rule is that you only need to identify one trustee, um, is what the, the FinCEN said in their FAQ. So if a trust uh, is owning 25% or more of a legal entity customer and there are multiple trustees, then you only need to identify one trustee. Even if four trustees, each trustee will be seen as an owner of, of the 25% block. So only need to really include one. Um, uh, moving on to a couple more of the uh, FAQs that I'll highlight here. FAQ number seven dealt with existing customers. This was uh, some helpful release by FinCEN. Uh, what they said was that you may use the CIP information if the beneficial owner has already gone through the CIP process. So if your, your legal entity, for instance, uh, has an account at a bank, uh, you might need to identify the CEO as a control person, right? Uh, but if the CEO already has an account with the financial institution, you can just rely on the information that the CEO submitted, assuming it's up to date, obviously, um, to satisfy uh, these, these requirements. Um, FAQ number 10, uh, a legal entity customer with multiple accounts, uh, what FinCEN said was that you may rely on the first account open up for certifying owners. So, you know, if the legal entity has four different accounts, you can rely on the information submitted when the first account was open. Um, FAQ number 17 related to updating information, and all FinCEN said here was that ownership information must be updated at the time of a, of, of a triggering event and that uh, the update requirement or the information needed to be collected uh, between account opening and a risk-related or triggering update is exactly the same. So it's the same sort of information. It's nothing less that you need to collect just because it's, a, it's an update uh, due to a risk-related trigger. Um, moving on, finally, just to a, a few of the recent developments in, in this space that we've seen. Uh, two, I wanted to point out um, uh, a direct result from these rules. Uh, first, FinCEN administrative ruling just this past week on May 16th. Uh, it issued a 90-day compliance relief for certain uh, financial services or products that automatically roll over or renew, um, like uh, certificate of deposits or loan accounts. Um, the relief really only applies to, to these, those two products. So each time a loan is renewed or a CD is rolled over, every time this happens, a new quote-unquote account is created, but many firms just automate this, this process and they don't actually create a new account relationship. So FinCEN said they wanted to consider it further and think it over, and that's why they uh, issued a 90-day temporary relief uh, for those products. And then finally, uh, just uh, here uh, in, in D.C. on Capitol Hill, there was congressional testimony last week from the FinCEN director, uh, Ken Blanco, and um, uh, in the testimony, uh, it was in front of the Subcommittee on Terrorism and Illicit Finance within the Financial Services Committee in the House. Uh, the key thing for this testimony had seemed that he was softening uh, his approach to enforcement of these rules. Acknowledge that the new rules aren't perfect and that they're a work in progress and that their primary focus Will, will not be enforcement, but rather will be uh, looking for firms to make a good faith compliance effort. So um, I'll pause there and turn it over to Sue uh, to talk about uh, some of the OBA. Uh, Thank you, Ben. And I'll cover the FINRA proposed OBA TFT rule. Um, FINRA rule 3290 was proposed on February 26th, and the comment period ended on April 27th. The proposed rule would require a registered person to provide his or her broker-dealer with a prior written notice of all investment-related or other business activities outside the scope of the relationship with the member. The investment-related is defined same as, as defined under Form U4, and business activity is, will be defined as one acting as an employee, independent contractor, sole proprietor, officer, director, or partner of another person, or receiving compensation or having the reasonable expectation of compensation from any other person as a result of the activity. Um, under the proposed rule, investment-related um, activity will be subject to more um, heightened supervisory requirements than that of imposed on the business activity. Um, a, a senior member firm would be required to assess the risk of the proposed investment activity and evaluate whether the proposed activity will interfere 
with or otherwise compromise a registered person's responsibilities to members' customers or be viewed by customers or public as part of the member's decisions based on upon the nature of the proposed activity and the member in which and, and the manner in which it will be offered. So based on and after the based on the evaluation of the investment acti related activity, the member would either approve the registered person's participation or approve subject to conditions or limitations or dis disapprove the participation. Um, on the la next slide, um, there's uh, there's a few impacts on the advisor activity. First of all, um, the investment advisor activity conducted um, on behalf of a duly registered firm or, or an advisory affiliate will be excluded under the proposed rule, and the proposed rule will not impose supervisory or record-keeping obligation on, on advisory activities conducted by a third-party, non-affiliated investment advisor. Yeah, thanks, Sue, and, and that's, uh, that, that's pretty significant. I think you know, what FINRA is trying to do, FINRA is reacting to the flow of registered reps uh, from the BD industry to the advisor industry. And you know, I think you could see this as a uh, you know, an indication by FINRA that they're trying to perhaps make the, uh, the framework a little friendlier for those who want to engage in advisory activity but at the same time have a broker-dealer hat on. Uh, we'll see where this goes. Uh, there, there's a bit of a split in terms of comments received, uh, a split in the industry. Some uh, think the control is, is, is necessary over you know, this type of activity uh, and, and uh, business activity, general, general outside business activity, uh, while others sort of embrace this but basically want a better understanding of what exactly would be the broker-dealer's obligation with respect to uh, advisory activity. So, not necessarily like a clear path here, but uh, you know more to come. But thanks. I think we wanted to turn now, in, in terms of our uh, last topic, uh, a recent no action letter uh, dealing with performance advertising. And Michael's going to handle that. Thanks, Cliff. Um, so we have a diagram here, uh, and the thing to really point out with the diagram is that on the the last row, uh, with Minnison Company and South State Advisory. Uh, were two investment advisors. They have a common parent, South Street Bank, which is in turn owned by South Street Corporation. So focusing on the bottom row, we have two investment advisors, and basically what just happened is that Minis is merged into uh, South State Advisory. So the advisor on the left is merging into South, Street, South State Advisory on the right, and what the, the request was is, well, after the merger, can Minis continue to use the track record that it had prior to the merger because Minis is going to continue as a separate division of South State Advisory. Um, and in requesting the relief, um, the, the uh, Minis uh, enterprise basically emphasized two things. Number one, uh, each advisor has its own management team, which is separate apart from the other management team, and each advisor has its own investment committee which is responsible for that advisor's, um, the advice that that advisor provides. And that's going to continue. So within South State Advisory, Minis uh, Division, um, after the merger, as, it, as it's called, uh, the same management team that existed within Minis when it was a separate company is going to continue when Minis is a separate division of South State Advisory. And same thing with the investment committee. It's the same uh, investment committee. It's going to continue to be responsible for making the investment decisions of Minutes division after the merger, and the staff said, okay, well, we will allow uh, the Minutes division to use uh, the track record that Minutes and Co. Uh, uh, created over, over time when it was a separate company. Um, and um, so basically, we'll have two uh, track records after the merger, um, just like we had two track records before the merger. Um, so it's nice, we'll have one for South State Advisory, and then we'll have one for the, for the separate division. Uh, within South State Advisory of Min the Minis Division, I, there's nothing really shocking here. Um, uh, I don't, you know, I've had a couple of calls with clients. No one was really surprised by this, um, but it was, I think it was a relatively easy letter for the staff to grant, given uh, the fact that everything is going to continue uh, post-merger as it was operating prior to the merger, and the fact that um, it's, it's all going to happen within one single uh, legal entity. Um, the staff was fine with um, because, as a, as a practical matter, Minis and Co. is going to live on as a separate division, and that separateness is really, I think, what gave the staff the comfort to grant the relief. 
great. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone. I think with that, we're uh, we're ready to wrap up. Uh, we want to thank everyone again for uh, joining us today, and we hope you'll join us for the uh, next program in the series. Uh, as a reminder, if you want to receive CLE credit for this webcast, please download the CLE sign-in sheet and evaluation form from your viewing console and follow the instructions for submission. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to any one of us, uh, as well as if you want a copy of the deck, uh, please feel free to uh, reach out to us. And again, thanks, uh, thanks everyone.